my youngest was second to third grade, and she was a sponge, and she got more to get out than any of us, simply because they operated the pool, and she was, okay. she, was, she was at the right age to be a sponge. So can you sponsor so, people in my country? Yes. <laughs> Some people wonder why I took my entire family with me if I was having crisis, but you know. Some people want to get to family with me if I was having crisis, but you know. Share the wealth of the Introductions. Who are you? What brings you to the lab? And specifically, what about the practical applications of rubrics are you interested in learning about? And also, what do you want to achieve? Um, I also want to start a little bit as well with what is a rubric, sort of based on your own experiences and your own perspective and your own perspectives. What are the rubrics that you're using them? Who is using them? Is it your own students? And when are they being used? Um, and then just to kind of continue the conversation with some examples of different type, types of rubrics. And the reason why I want to do that is to create a collaborative design for a discussion forum rubric in Canvas using Google Sheets um, as a way to make that process a little bit um, less nightmarish. Um, and then talking about how you can share rubrics once you're inside of a course with different faculty members um, and even within the Active Teaching Lab Canvas website. And then at the end, I think sort of a challenge activity is sort of creating or crafting a rubric for the Wisconsin experience. And on your desk in front of you, um, I have a little bit of, I have a small leaflet that's sort of being distributed uh, kind of broadly across campus now. Uh, just sort of the important pillars of the Wisconsin experience, defining the undergraduate experience here on campus. Um, so it's four of the core values or pillars uh, that we on campus hope that each undergraduate um, achieves, then sort of ending with some lingering questions and conclusions. Um, so in front of you, sort of, Everyone, most people already know this. We have the activity sheet. On the activity sheet, um, I added something at the very bottom. If you have the digital copy of the activity sheet, it would be great if you could log into that. The reason why is because I've created an additional spreadsheet um, for some of the collaborative work that we're going to be doing with Google Sheets to import those rubrics into Canvas. So if you scroll down all the way at the bottom of the activity sheet, uh, you should see the spreadsheet for uh, You should see the spreadsheet for group work as a um, Google sheet um, that you can log into just to have some additional practice space. Um, and that URL is at the top of um, your activity sheet. So if we can go ahead and go around the room and start maybe with uh, Jessica. What brings you to today's lab? What can we help you achieve? Yeah, uh, so I'm Jessica. I teach in biological systems engineering. Inspiration. I use a lot of rubrics. Uh, inspiration in what way? <laughs> I always have a hard time finding like that line between too general and too specific okay. in rubrics. I think I it's hard to find that balance, I think. Okay. Great. Dan, what are you? Uh, I'm Dan Powell. I have a colleague, JP. JP brought me here today. Um, also so I will be taking notes in relation to this, but I always have the same question about rubrics, which is what are our rubrics? Okay. So, 
Sense. Um, the actual physical construction of a rubric or sort of more conceptual from, orientation? Conceptual. How do you go from no rubric to a rubric? Nice. Yes. Hopefully, it seems like. Yeah, Phil. Hello. I'm a visiting professor from Japan. Welcome. So, uh, of my English uh, is doing crazy. So, mm -hmm. I'm afraid of. Uh, I could understand uh, all of your uh, meeting, but sure. I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in the rubric. Okay. I'm not uh, familiar with the rubric, and I have not used the rubric mm -hmm. of my uh, lecture. Okay. So uh, today, uh, uh, I would like to uh, know what is rubric? Great. <laughs> so, uh, uh, please help me to understand. Great. Iman. Hi, I'm Iman. Uh, I'm a TA in English. And uh, so, a few questions. I want to echo some of the comments so it's balanced between individualized and general comments. As well as, uh, so in the summer, I TA with a course. We started with a rubric, and then finally we just went straight to a street, uh, street grader and used individualized comments okay. for two reasons. One, the uh, scale that we used wasn't really aligned with, uh, uh, with the other scales that we had, of course. So we would do it from zero to five, and then at three on that scale, it wouldn't really be a B or an AB okay. on that particular assignment. Yeah. And the other reason was that I realized that a lot of students would prefer individualized comments, even if you just include their name in the feedback. Mm -hmm. So I think that kind of naming or individualized comments might be preferred by the students' perspective than general comments. All right, that brings up an interesting point that I, I hope we get to um, towards the end with design rubrics and whether or not students themselves can design their own rubric for their project, for example. Awesome. Corey? Power. I'm an instructional designer with Do Active Technology, so kind of a colleague of Sid and Dan and Dave and JT as well. Um, and I'm just here to learn more about how everybody else uses rubrics. I like the idea from how you can balance between the specific to, to general or vice versa, um, but also trying to learn more how rubrics can fit within Canvas mm -hmm. specifically. So <laughs> still learning the Canvas LMS. Awesome. Lauren. Um, Lauren, um, I do language things, and um, I've been using rubrics for a long time, but I am in particular curious about this importing a rubric into Canvas, how that works, um, and updating, because rubrics seem to be more of an iterative process for me. Um, so once they're in there, um, what's the best way to, if we need to, alter something, do you do that within Canvas? Do you do it in your original one and re-upload it? What's the best? Awesome. There you go. Okay. So I hope we get to a lot of these. I'm sure we will. Um, sort of the way I hope a lot of these questions of individual rubrics and into Canvas and the design process will occur um, over the course of your own work um, today in the lab. But I do want to start, I think, um, with Minako's question, what is a rubric? Um, so I'm going to give you a few minutes to answer sort of and think about some of these few questions. How do you define a rubric? What's the purpose? What is it used, et cetera? And what are your own experiences with rubrics, either as a student, either as an instructor or instructional designer, um, if that experience is necessarily different? And then we're going to use this to look at some examples of different types of rubrics, categories of rubrics, if you will, that may or may not be useful for the discussion for an activity that we're going to do afterwards. So I'll give you a few minutes to think about these, and then we will Keep on. And Sid, if you would like to work with them with that, or whatever. Great. 
An example, and Jessica brought up an interesting definition of a rubric where you start from zero and you work your way to hopefully to an A or a hundred. And I've always thought of a rubric as a hundred and you just start losing points as soon as you submit the assignment. Uh, but in for your own definitions, what are how would you define a rubric? So, uh, my definition is a structure to describe the content of So can we say structure and expectations? Or what about you? 
Um, a series of categories upon which to, to assess something. And it could be anything from student work to a conference proposal. Okay. So to add on to that, maybe structured expectations for categorical assessment or evaluation, maybe? Can we, add, can we play the telephone game and continue over here? <laughs> yeah. I think we talked a lot about formative learning, but I think it could be like a set of guidelines for formative learning. Okay. So maybe, but could, is it always formative? Not always. It can be some of so I guess it's a instructional design to be. <laughs> I guess it, you know it depends on how you want to use the rubric and what sure. your project okay. entails. So it can be used both formatively or summatively. Um, you know, formative first parts of the project when you're accepting like if students are writing a rough draft, you do a formative say, hey, this is where you are, um, or you don't have to use it. At that point, and just use it for the summative okay. and end final draft. Okay. It can be complex. I don't want to get too much time. But and there's, you know, <laughs> I mean, I love the concision that this board requires, Lauren. Can I pick up on that yes. and ask a question? Sure. So, as you were talking, what ran into my head is you know, sometimes it's hard to determine, okay, which criteria or which categories right. are most important to assess in a summative thing because there's more than what you really can focus on. Right. So if you were using it in a formative way and there were rough drafts along the way, mm -hmm. would you maybe in the first rough draft consider assessing these two categories and the second rough draft these two categories and by the end you have all four or five or whatever? Absolutely. And do it sort of broken down but then together. Yeah. If, yeah. So I'm just writing, speaking from a writing instructor perspective. With language, but if you're if you have a project and you want to scaffold, really it's all about what are your objectives for the project or for that act, particular activities and what what purposes that serve in the entire course. So I do like that. Absolutely, you have your mini rubrics. Okay, we're supposed to meet, learn this in this section, and here's the rubric for that. In this next section, we're going to build upon that, and then these skills and here's the rubric for these next level skills and abilities. Because even in a paper I could think, well, first and foremost, is there a structure there? Did they sure. actually structure their paper well? And sure. then by the time you get to the end, then maybe you're looking more at transitions and grammatical things, or, you know what yeah. I mean, or something like that. I don't know. No, you make I'm a great pulling point. Pulling this stuff out no. of my yeah. head. And not if I was teaching it <laughs> and I'd totally restructure my course to have more more rough drafts with those elements. Mini, with the mini, yeah, that's great. Yeah, your hand is. Uh, I agree with everything I'm hearing that it's all a lot of what we're saying is focusing on what the rubric value is for the instructor, how yes. we're using it, what is our right. process, all of that. But I also want to say it's a form of communication to the student. Right. It is a message that they read, it's, it's, it's justifying, it's explaining. Uh, but it's also, I mean, it's, it's trying to elaborate beyond a letter mm -hmm. or a number. Uh -huh. and this is what the letter and number, to an extent, means. Mm -hmm. So it's a form of communication. So to that end, we could say the users of, of a rubric obviously are instructors, instructional designers. What's the possibility for a student to use a rubric? Assuming the communication is not a one way street. There's a lot of things. I mean, the basic one is a they see the grade and they read the rubric and they know what the grade means a bit more than they did. Mm -hmm. um, but they also can self-grade, they can self-assess, they can peer evaluate, they can use it in planning, they can use it to do a checklist, they can use it as a, as a goal. Sure. And I think it goes back to the question of how specific or general do rubric need to be? Because you can have your very basic numerical uh, <laughs> rubric, but then Okay, you have got a five, which means it's advanced level or good level, but what does that actually mean? So if you have specific categories with specific explanations of each range of category, then it's a little bit better. Mm -hmm. um, and always with my rubrics, I add additional comments, but that takes up more time as well. So, so 
which defeats maybe defeats the, the purpose of so a rubric. So could we say that rubric, uh, maybe the, I don't know, the purpose of a rubric is for efficiency, or is it for instructor efficiency, or is it for student understanding? But your comment saying you, you yeah. sort of lamented the fact that you add comments to something that is already structured enough to give comments. Right. But, yeah. yeah. So the I question of fairness as well, okay. right? I guess like that's why I tried to. What was the first part? I'm sorry. Fairness. Yeah. So to yourself, but to students. Being graded equally? Yeah. I guess like that's why. Sure. But your rubric can fail, right? Because you yourself have been with that. Yeah. Absolutely. But once you yeah, graded the fine. exam and you realize that one's failed, then well, you adjust it. Well, it's nice to take a little preview and pre-adjust your expectations after your preview. So this question of specific and general, I think, is really interesting. And I, and I found these um, just sort of very silly examples of rubrics. I think they're solid in terms of their definitional perspective. So an example of a holistic rubric sort of treating the entire experience or the entire task for example, uh, breakfast in bed, right? So in terms of specific and general, you have all food is perfectly cooked, presentation surpasses expectations, and recipient is kept exceptionally comfortable throughout the meal. That sounds great, but what does that even mean, right? What perfectly cooked, I mean? According to you? No, according to the evaluator standard right, or to the- Right, exactly, according to him. The presentation surpasses the expectations. If you, the person who's preparing your breakfast in bed, you know, they just botched it the last time. Um, exceptionally comfortable, is that variable between individuals? Could you really use this rubric for your partner versus your child that's preparing your food, for example? An analytic rubric looks a little bit um, more like the Jeopardy board. Um, here you have your evaluative criteria. So what are the things, what are the pieces the expectation or the categorical assessments of food, presentation, and comfort um, with beginning, developing, we talk, and Corey just mentioned this, we're getting to that superior status. Um, one thing that I really like with this, and sort of at least in the two examples that we've seen so far, is that perfection almost seems unobtainable because it's predicated on surpassing an expectation that wasn't communicated by the report or wasn't communicated by anything else, just sort of you've been surprised by the work product. Um, it could be horrible, and you'd be surprised by that, right? So you should give that student an A again. Well, I, I'm, I'm looking at that, and I agree that that's, typical, that's a very typical problem of a rubric, but it's one that you can think about and calibrate again. That mm -hmm. if you think about what your final grade should be, uh, if they meet expectations, whether that be an A or an AB or whatever, and then you have a surpassing category that gives beyond that score, then it's possible to have, I mean, you know, you don't expect everyone who does an assignment to get 100%, that's normal. But your grade score can give above the what you expect. Mm -hmm. And that way, if you have your top category be beyond expectations, and they actually are giving beyond expectations, then the score is also beyond expectations. Mm -hmm. As long as it's calibrated right, that's a mistake people typically make, and it goes back to what you were saying, was that the grade scale doesn't correspond to the categories of the rubric, Right. most of the time, unless you actually think that through. Right. So. Which is something we'll see, because you've generated that yourself, and we'll get that through. Laura, are you going to say something? Mm -hmm. Nope. So just another example, um, and I think maybe this is for me, in my own experience in, in teaching French, this is more the type of rubric that I always use, because it's very easy to click through. Um, so sort of for me, having 25, 26 students, just the efficiency of this um, just seemed a little bit easier, because with Third language learning, you know, the mechanics of spelling or all the verbs conjugated is, you know, have used the vocabulary from the chapter that we're studying, um, things like that can be added into the rubric very easily and very easily assessed. Um, this is one that came up in a lab last semester. It's one that I had never heard of before, actually. It's called a single point rubric. And Lauren, you are nodding your head. Yeah, that's I, because I brought that one up. Because you know, I have uh, seen them. You know, I haven't actually used them, but I thought what I really liked about it is um, the the concerns and the advanced part uh -huh. gives you a space to to give the commenting that Corey was talking about to really help a student understand why they landed where they landed. Mm -hmm. Well, what I don't, what I'm not really certain that I understand is is this just a baseline? Like, is it met or not met? Like, yeah, right. Like, is it like right. this is? is that really what and I guess is? in my in my frame of mind, is this a C? 
So, so this could be. And then that's that this, your, this is enough. I would use this for something more formative. Okay. Whereas, so like a draft, for example. That you yeah. Might so whereas the Jeopardy board one would be my summative. Mm -hmm. I think. I think that's how I would do it. So. So by this level, by level two, you're supposed to meet these criteria, and you. And it shows to the extent. You know, so it gives them the feedback that they would know for their next iteration, their mm -hmm. next draft, to improve it before they get the, not that they would see the, I, I think what I would do is I would give them the Jeopardy rubric yeah. from the beginning, sure. sure they know where we're headed. Yeah. Sure. This is your ultimate thing that you're going for. Uh -huh. And then along the way with the drafts, I'd have them know, you know, this is, this is where you could use improvement. So that when you get to the Jeopardy rubric, you can be at a three or a four. Yeah. And for the student that like really wants that A, either a 93 or 100, regardless, how do you, in, I guess in your own instructional experiences, do you ever address what exceeding expectations means? Like what does it look like? An example of when Surprise your expectations me. have been exceeded <laughs> by a course they have no idea what to shoot for, or right. is it really just a shot in the dark of overwhelming success in the project? Because to me, that just seems to suggest that A is unattainable. Right. So don't hope for it. Hope it be A, B, and maybe you'll get an A. It just seems sort of a deflating. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it accomplishes an A, then what you said is not, then it's not unattainable. If you set your numbers right and accomplish actually for something like 6%, for yeah. example, then an A is very attainable by that second row. And then someone could exceed in one area. Right. Right below in another area, and the two cancel each other out. To yeah, like super uncomfortable, so but the food tastes great. great. That's where you right. can, be, can be used, yeah. but not on a scale where you lose that 25% of your grade just by losing one. Right. Where right. the number eight across the top that makes that one. It makes it devastating for a lot of students. And this is exactly the, the sort of point scale that Dan was talking about. Um, Dan, would you mind logging? Remember how that works. Oh. So on a five point scale, obviously a 100 would be yeah. like five. This was something I put together for an assignment that had four or five different, number of different criteria that had different weights. Some of them were weighted 25 points, some had 20, some had five. Right. And in order to come out with eventually giving the, the, the student a grade that actually corresponded to the real grade scale, mm -hmm. um, this, this allows you to say, what is the upper limit of the points on a, out of five if you want to give them an A? And, and what's the midpoint of that? What's the lower? So for example, the five, nine, if your grade scale's on the very far left, mm -hmm. okay. is that 93 and above is an A, then 4.65 out of five is an A. And if you take the default canvas rubric, which automatically goes 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, uh -huh. then what you're actually giving is either 100% or if they lose one point, they're getting uh, a C or a high BC, 70, like yeah, 80%. Yeah, so it would be... Yeah, it would be. Yeah. And so that's what a 4 is. And it was, I used this to try to explain to instructors why their grade skill became, what, what I always found, we had these very elaborate grade skills for writing assignments. Where you would take off one point, one point, one point, and by the end of it, instructors were always saying, "Oh, but I gave them an extra five because that was way too low." You know, they were always wrestling with the final grade, mm -hmm. but they were doing that because if you have a bunch of criteria out of ten and you start knocking off one or two points, you're actually knocking them down ten percent every time. Mm -hmm. And cumulatively, that's the same. That is a, a big dig on their grade. Mm -hmm. So this was trying to say, well, if you really want it to get you to the grade you want without having to do that adjustment at the end, then you need to think about setting these fractional values of 5, 4.65, 4.4, 4.5, and down so that those numbers actually correspond to the grade scale for the course. And then when you're done and you have the actually graded with it, you get a grade that makes sense. It's the one you kind of were aiming for, mm -hmm. you know, in your, in your collection. Does that, make, does that make sense or not? It's, a, it's more complicated than it needs to be in the screenshot. The actual group, the, the spreadsheet is a little bit easier to use than that. I threw a link into the handout for it. Uh, I got the part for the upper 
a section of this video, but what's yeah. made it lower? Oh, in this course, this one came from a course which had a funky grade scale. And so the, the A, well, no, actually, it's the mid-range. A is 93 to 100 in this one. So 95 is the middle point of that. So that would be a 4.75 out of 5 would be a 95? Would be a, yeah. So actually, I, I, I think that what I eventually used to set was that blue set in the middle, where it's like, out of 5, A was set to 4.75. Out of 10, A is set to 9.5. Out of 20, A is set to 19. Yeah? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that works very well. The only thing is that Canvas does not allow you to have a grade scale at the 20, where the top range is not 20. You have to give the top value has to be 100% in Canvas. And then you can do this below that, but that means you really do need the exemplary category, which is, yeah, you right. so nailed this that I'm giving you 100% of this category. And beyond it, I'm giving you an A plus, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, so you can do that. Or you could just say, anybody who gets an A is 100% in that course. You know, and that's a little bit, that's not fighting against Canvas. Uh, but this, the grade scale, the blue section in the middle are the numbers that you would actually need to set your criteria to equal if you want to come out with giving a C on the rubric actually gets a C in your grade. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense now? Mm -hmm. So this is going to be useful for now because I would like to move towards um, creating a rubric uh, for a discussion post in Canvas and we're going to use Google Sheets to draft it and then import it. However, this, uh, the link to this spreadsheet is at the bottom of your activity sheet. I hope everyone can get into it um, right above the, the gray curriculum. Is there anyone that's not able to get into this? Corey, Ryan? Where, so where is it? It's on it's the, at the bottom of the activity sheet. Bottom, yeah. Oh, the spreadsheet right yep. there. Yep. And I also have paper copies. Um, not paper copies, but if you would rather just use a sheet of paper, try and There you go. So the way that this happened, this has to work in Canvas, is you have to follow this um, this format, if you will. So just to give an example with the Wisconsin experience, one of the pillars of the Wisconsin experience is empathy. That is a, an evaluative criteria. The quality of empathy could be distinguished. For example, you have distinguished empathy, a superior, advanced, all the way down to insufficient, whatever. The column that needs to be, the third column needs to be the point value. So here, for example, you would have empathy, distinguished, and if you have a five point rubric, it would be five points. And then for three, however, or Everything here is five, everything here would be four, everything here would be three. Does that make sense so far? Have I lost anyone? All good? Jessica? In terms of the formatting of the spreadsheet. I'm like picking a piece that's ahead, I'm good. <laughs> okay. So what I would like for you to do in this spreadsheet is think of a rubric and the qualities of a good discussion forum post in terms of length, or images or whatever sort of evaluative criteria that you have. Two examples of the qualitative criteria is it, you know, distinguished and then superior and assigning two points. Either five points, 10 points, 100 points, whatever the case may be. The reason why I'm asking you to do it this way is because we'll have to copy and paste this to put it into Canvas, but it has to be in this way. I realize this doesn't look visually, this doesn't correspond to a rubric, but this is how it works. So I'll give you a few minutes, maybe five, to think about what are the actual criteria of a good discussion post, and then to think of what are some of the qualifying criteria, superior, et cetera, and then to assign some point values. If you could do that within this spreadsheet, that would be helpful. At the bottom, I've created some new um, pages if you would like additional practice space. This is sort of my just staging ground. Um, but I will leave this up here for you as sort of a, a guidepost um, to help you with that design process. All good? Lauren, you okay? I think so. So the left side is going to be a criteria like creativity or something like that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so and for example, then, to give you the example here with those oh, concepts experience. Okay. Got it. 
the pillars of the Wisconsin experience that we are evaluating are in particular. Where you have distinguished, is that where you would put like a paragraph descriptor? Yep, distinguished is, okay. distinguished empathy means this. Okay. Superior empathy means that. Okay. The third column is the point value that you assign to right. distinguished. To distinguished, and then about it. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. So I'll give you a few minutes to work through that. work with someone doesn't necessarily have to be a sign of activity. Corey, how are you doing? So in a discussion post, let's just say we evaluate, yeah, grammar, and then maybe just say um, you have distinguished grammar. Oh, just distinguished by mm -hmm. comments? Right, because that's sort of, that's the, the quality of the grammar is distinguished. Okay. And then you can hide the text and explain what distinguished means, but the, cat the qualitative category is distinguished. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so then do you want to give them five points? Sure. And then another category, one step below distinguished means um, okay. sufficient. Okay. Or readable, you know. And then you give that one value. Okay. And then we can go over here and maybe create one more evaluation criterion. Let's say length. Just for the sake of the value. Has to be distinguished as well. Okay. And same number of points. Sounds good? Oh good. Okay. Thanks. You're right. Uh, I think so. Are we doing this in a group? Or? You can do it individually, or we're going to copy and paste just to give an example of what that looks like in the camera. So, where would you put like, the description? You could very easily just go like this. Distinguished is. Okay, it's fine. Like, Canvas won't get angry with you guys. We will see. It should not. In the practices that I did, it did not. And this is assuming if you want to upload this into Canvas. Otherwise, you can just exactly. create your own rubric externally. Correct. Right. Okay. That's great. So Canvas doesn't have this. It doesn't have an option where you can add rubric and then manually. It does. Oh, it does. So we're going to get to that. Just to show okay, you. okay. The, and the reason okay. why I wanted to do it this way is to show you that it is terrible. Sure. Okay. And this might facilitate um, the process. And it sort of relates to Sid's question of, I believe, uh, sort of editing, design, where do you house it, how are you editing it, Great. versus editing the canvas for free. You want to share stuff. Okay. okay. <laughs> Thanks. I'm still yeah. learning canvas. <laughs> That's what we're here for. <laughs> Who is this one in, in row nine? Uh, that would be me. That's you, Laura. Yeah. Um, and with the, there only being two or three levels, do we have five points or do we have three points? Oh yeah, should it be three, three, two, one? You could do it that way. It'll work. Or sure. is it is this where you get into the weighted rubric where certain criteria are no. less important? I have not weighted it. Other criteria. Okay. Can you if you do weight something, can you um, in Canvas import that weightedness, or do you do it after? It's I think you have to do it afterwards once you import it from the issues. So far, so good. Mm -hmm. 
Someone ready to see if this experiment totally fails? Sure. All right. So you have your um, rubric designed here, and Google Sheets for Excel, I think it works um, in that way. So if you go into the Canvas page, um, currently for the course, I have a discussion set up already. So I'm just going to sort of walk through it. Please, if I'm taking a step wrong, please let me know immediately. So this is for today's um, discussion with the rubric. So because I'm on the instructor side, you may not, you're obviously not going to see all of these. So if I'm losing you in any steps, please just let me know. So I created the discussion, you know, discuss and be evaluated on your discussion. Those are the best um, instructions. Um, going to the edit portion, it is graded. Oh, who submitted? So you see we have a discussion portion on the three, the kebab or the shish kebab, whatever it's called. And the top right, adding a rubric. The problem is this is what happens in Canvas immediately. Either you can create a, a rubric yourself and click and click through, click through, click through, um, click a bunch of options here down at the bottom. Um, and then towards, if we have time today, I do want to show you adding criterion from uh, the Canvas out outcomes, which could be linked with APHIS to make sort of that uh, rubric align. Going to find a rubric, and then you have every rubric that you've ever had access to in Canvas, which that could be an overwhelming list. Unfortunately, this is a complicated process. I apologize. Then manage rubrics. And finally, import. And this is where you would copy and paste your first everything we have. I'm just going to do that small little section. So I've taken the evaluative criteria with the qualitative criteria and just the first um, little piece. So. So the title does appear. So you clicked add rubric to get there? Yeah, so clicking okay. add rubric and then to import rubric. Right. And then your rubric has appeared. So that's just getting it into Canvas. It's sort of a complicated process. I understand that. Going back to the discussion, opening the discussion, going back to that. Adding a rubric, find your rubric, and that's called the. I hope this works. Yeah. And now your rubric has been assigned to the discussion. Dan. What were the delimiters between the data points? They were just little dashes that I added, you added just for visual distinction. And does it need those, or does it automatically create a rubric? You could not insert a table, sort of like a format condition table, if I understand correctly. You have to have just a sort of a, a naked column in Excel, if you will. Which I can show you. Can you go back to what the thing was that you said? Mm -hmm. So this is not a table. No. So in, a, in the sense that you could not sort this in from these data sets sort of alphabetically if you want to. Have I lost it? It's just a spreadsheet. Yeah, these are just unconnected cells that I've populated with text. Okay, and There's, that's what it takes to make the rubric so you just automatically grab whatever. So long as it is in this specific order. It has to be in the evaluative criteria at the part of the, the descriptor value. Then the point then the point value. value. Uh -huh. So no, visually, it's, it's not no the, or anything. It's not a CSV or anything. Exactly. No comments. 
and that dash is something you put in, but it doesn't need that. Right. right. The reason why I put the dash is because if you just wanted to say um, distinguished empathy means you're awesome, and it's not the space that it, I mean, it actually is figuring out that there's a colon there. So Correct. Given a long description, it's not going to like make that into a forty. So long as you wrap the text and keep that in the column. Mm -hmm. And so, cut it and paste the bits in. Hmm? You just cut and paste it. You just cut and paste. It does require a lot of different clicking. However, clicking in Canvas versus clicking between two tabs and then copy and paste just because it looks like you're having a sigh of relief. Like, you know, it is a lot, a lot easier um, than that. AJ. I think I read when you imported it that it was tab delimited. Mm -hmm. So that might be the thing. Oh, tabs. But I think you'd have to do it that way because I'm pretty sure if you hit tab, it would jump you out of the window that you weren't using. So I think you can just like type it in. And you want to stop it the last thing. Yeah. Like if you hit, if you go back to where you imported it, is, you, um, you could just type it directly in. I so just this. following through again. Going back to adding. Oh. Part of this is my trick to um, see you do that again. Because it was um, I'm just going to go to a discussion rubric that, or discussion that we don't already have a rubric on. So you go into the original discussion itself, going to. Oh, there's already a rubric, I'm sorry. Clicking on the. Oh, there's a rubric there too. I just created a new discussion. I'm not getting that pop up rubric. Did you click the three dots? Yeah. You have to, so you have to save the discussion and then go back into it. Uh -huh. oh, yeah. So I can I'll start a new one and then give you the walkthrough. So task two. And then, AG, would you mind explaining again the. So creating the discussion, clicking that it's graded, right? Points possible, well, let's just say 10 points possible. Um, that should be sufficient. Save. And then back onto the three dots. Where did you see that? Yep. So I think I didn't have it as a graded discussion. Ah, that's why. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And of course, to get to uh, the question that you had instead as well, just sort of looking at this within Canvas, um, all of these pop-ups occur, and you have to edit each individual cell, which isn't necessarily distinct from doing it in Google Sheets or within Excel. Just the visual component seems a little more unwelcoming. Windows are really buggy, like especially on a Mac. Like it's just. And the difference between Chrome and Firefox, too, I've noticed in my own, it does sort of result in page orientation differences. <laughs> Sam, yeah. Um, just uh, to answer a question that I had, uh, can you do this not in discussions, but just through rubrics? And yeah, you can. I went to mm -hmm. outcomes and then rubrics and add rubric and import rubric. Yeah. And got to the same thing too. So mm -hmm. presumably also with assignments, you can do it there. Mm -hmm. So this is an example of doing it within a discussion. Any, lost anyone so far? Obviously, this is deep in the weeds of Canvas. Oh. You mind? You okay? I'm oh, good. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, one of the, I guess, in the in the few minutes that we have left, the last one of the last things that I wanted to talk about um, was the use of a rubric in outcomes. Um, which, um, Sid, would you mind describing a little bit AFIS and how that links to outcomes? I'm. Um, my, my understanding, which is incomplete, mm -hmm. uh, so every course needs to have outcomes that as a result of taking this course you'll be able to plot one, two, three, four, four or five things, and that these are set for the course. So that if you're taking English 101, you'll learn these five things regardless of which section you're in. Uh, APHIS is a tool and so this data can go into a campus database, and APHIS can get that data out of the database. And then in Canvas, it can say, oh, you're teaching English 101. Here are the outcomes, uh, the course uh, outcomes for 101. 
So it's a, it's a system that has this information, if, if it's been entered, um, and then can pull it back. So it helps get you consistency mm -hmm. among all the sections of English 101, and also that campus administrators can look across and say, what are we teaching here anyway? Yeah. Um, things, things like that. Okay. So but they're not necessarily connected to Canvas outcomes. That's a different tool. Uh, okay. So it's outcomes, not... the word outcomes means diff slightly different but similar things depending okay. on where you're using the word. Okay. So what did you just say? That this, this tool is not connected to APIN? Outcomes, Canvas outcomes, I do not understand it to be connected to course APIS outcomes. Okay. okay. There is a, if you teach a timetable course, you'll have a link in the left called. Course syllabus APIS. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, and that okay. tool does draw from right. the APIS outcomes. Okay. Well, because this is not a timetable course, it's just a Right, so you don't have it. But, okay. um, but Canvas, out, that outcomes link in Canvas is something conceptually similar, but technically different. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So say, for example, one of the outcomes of your course is related to the Wisconsin experience. Right? That's why I wanted to drop those on there. In the outcomes tool, you can obviously create this outcome called empathy and humility. So you can create an outcome that, of the course that is necessarily this. Maybe something that applies to lots of different rubrics or different portions of your course. And so now it's automatically been created. So far, so good. Let's say you wanted to add that to the discussion. So you already have a set number of outcomes in the course or at the departmental level that you've imported from a Canvas course that has been housed or has already been created um, in your own um, in your own department. Back to the homepage. And going back into the edit settings of your rubric, you can find this outcome that you've already determined for sort of the broader, maybe summative assessments of your course or the summative evaluation of your course, and already have that plugged into Canvas. So that way, each time you're not going back in and perhaps even altering um, the outcome of the course. So that way, you sort of have that standard set feature already in Canvas, easy for you to use um, and to just sort of plug and play um, into your rubric and it automatically imports. It does show up differently for students. So this could be an interesting way for you uh, to distinguish sort of larger values and outcomes of the course itself, distinct from whether or not their discussion post is 500 words um, and it was actually, it had a video or something like that as a component of the course, sort of higher level um, evaluations and or higher level objectives of the course that you can include into the rubric that are visually distinct for students. So far, so good. You clicked on find outcome and that's how you added it? Yep. Okay. And even though we've included, we've imported this rubric from Google Sheets, um, you can still add a new criterion um, and add to that if you want to go through that um, unfortunate process of trying to edit the rubric with inside of Canvas. Um, I wouldn't recommend that just because it, it is far more complicated than I think that it necessarily needs to be. Um, what if I wanted to change this rubric a little bit, like slightly make changes? So would I need to copy and paste and import the rubric you can, again? You can just click on edit here. Okay. And then you have the little pencils that show up, um, and you can so change it there a little bit. Sure. But if you have like these massive substantive changes that you're making to a rubric, I would just import it. Okay. Versus going through each one of these little pencil sure. windows. And, okay. Going down. If you wanted to update an outcome, and you went in and you updated it in outcomes, would it automatically update on the rubric, or do you have to re-add that outcome to the rubric? Well, let's test that.
So then the yeah, order does not automatically update. To answer your question. Well, let's take help this work then. It does not. At least here it didn't. Okay. So then adding outcomes to each individual number might actually just be more hassle than it could necessarily be worth, but you only have to add outcomes once mm -hmm. um, to the course and edit them. Yeah, yeah. I'm wondering if anybody here knows anyone using campus outcomes. I've never heard of anyone using it. I've heard of people using the APHIS outcomes and limited mm -hmm. like school of pharmacy and a few others. But anybody come across someone using campus outcomes to see what you think? No, uh, but what I've read when I when we were transitioning and I knew more about campus than I remember now, <laughs> it seemed like outcomes are really most of most value in K-12. Where it's like you have a standard that all third graders will be able to do something, and that your school could set up these outcomes and they could be attributed to, to all the all the third grade classes. Mm -hmm. So everybody who's teaching third grade could then access these standard outcomes. Uh, but usually, when someone asks me, I tell them that they're more an advanced teacher and to to wait. One thing, in advance, one thing I can think of that may be useful is if you are using outcomes through Canvas Commons and you're sort of inheriting a course, you can already see what, in recent past iterations, what some of those outcomes have been. If it's a standardized course, like for the example you mentioned, English 101, if, you know, from, if that changes faculty hands from one semester to another, but you sort of have that already designed Canvas shell, you know what at least the course outcomes are, and maybe as a way to avoid the hassle of the APHIS background, perhaps. Tim? Um, one thing I'd say from a lot of attending a lot of sessions about APHIS outcomes is that APHIS is the tool that campus is using for doing this. Mm -hmm. And it's not available to use yet to everybody, but it will be coming and it will be shared and at some point sure. that here. Um, so if you are really interested in this, Putting your energy into setting up APHIS would probably be better than using the Canvas one that isn't the one that Canvas that is choosing to use. Mm -hmm. So, does APHIS connect to rubrics? Like, it, it, yes, it will. It will, <laughs> but, but it's not, not yet. quite yet. Yeah, they keep hearing people say that it's going to. And on the bottom of today's activity sheet, there are two links to the current initiative APHIS. You can get more specific updates where they are in that timeline, in addition to DESOL, which is an assessment learning analytics initiative. But I do want to emphasize that on the digital version of the activity sheet, a lot of the step-by-step -step links or step-by-step -step processes that we went through for importing a rubric from Google Sheets into Canvas, those links are available. And Jessica, specifically for you and for others as well, at the top where it says tips for rubrics, you have two uh, resources that have been developed into the Teach Online UW program. Um, to kind of work through whether or not too specific versus too general, um, to, so you can drill down into more detail um, into those into those resources. Um, so it seems like we have hopefully a lot of your questions. Um, the one that we did not, I think, address um, is individual rubrics and what student contributions um, can be made into those, and whether or not the, the scalability of rubrics are two questions that we still we still have outstanding, but hopefully think about those over the course of the rest of the day and the weekend. And um, if you don't mind filling out a few comments on your evaluation sheet. Uh, tomorrow morning at 8.30, we have um, intra-departmental collaboration um, on tap with bagels and coffee. Um, and we hope to see you there. And if not next week, um, I believe we are starting Thursday with another iteration of Pressbooks and Engage eText, and that'll be one o'clock on next Thursday. So thank you for coming, um, and have a good afternoon.